in. Can you give me a heads up when you start recording? Uh, I think I'll just wait for the notification. There you go. All good. <laughs> Great. Uh, welcome everyone to this uh, Bug Life Pollinator webinar for the Seven Bee Lines project. I'm Kate. I'm the Conservation Officer with Bug Life. Um, Caitlin's done the introductions, but I'll do them again for the sake of the recording. Caitlin Alverson, the, uh, the Bee Lines intern, and we've got Nigel uh, Jones, who's a local entomologist, who's uh, the star of the show tonight. I'm going to whiz through really briefly just a bit of context setting of what Seven Bee Lines is. Uh, and why we're running this webinar, but I'm going to be very, very quick because we just want to have pure pollinator goodness, really, from from Nigel. So um, I will share my screen. Remember to share the sound. Because I've got a little video to go. Ah, that is not the right screen to be sharing. There we go. OK, I hope everyone can see that if if you can't see my presentation, put something in the in the chat uh, and Kate will, Caitlin will give me a heads up uh, on whether or not you can see it. Um, but yes, uh, Bug Life is the Invertebrate, Co Invertebrate Conservation Trust. So we basically represent anything uh, without a backbone. Um, so that's from, you know, beetles to ants to spiders to crabs. Uh, we cover everything. Um, the Seven Bee Lines project is um, based around pollinators. Uh, we're a heritage lottery funded project. We're one of the green recovery fund projects. So it's a year long um, and I'll tell you a bit about it. So seven B lines, what are the B lines? Um, so Bug Life spent 10 years uh, working with um, other people to map these three kilometer wide uh, pathways that join up the whole of the UK um, and they connect all of our wildflower rich habitats and will create these highways for pollinators to move and other wildlife uh, through our countryside. That background map there is Shropshire's um, bee lines and um, that's what me and Caitlin are doing. We're delivering the seven bee lines project. We're starting to populate these three kilometre wide strips with wildflower rich habitat. Um, this year's focus is between Bridge North and Telford, um, but we want spillover benefits to the rest of the county through things like this webinar and training um, and lessons learned and engaging local communities. Our partners are our delivery partner Shropshire Wildlife Trust, so they help us with events um, and uh, ecological advice. Uh, as I said before, we're nat National Lottery Heritage funded. We're working with Telford and Recon Council and Apley, who have basically put up their sites um, for the uh, restoration or, or creation of wildflower rich habitats. And just to put, briefly run through what we're doing on the ground, um, you can see these maps here. Um, this is the Apley Estate. I hope you can see my cursor and you can just see these yellow patches and also these green lines. The yellow patches is where we're doing species rich grassland restoration. So basically flower, fl more diverse meadows uh, along the River Severn. Um, and uh, the green lines are where we're sowing wildflower rich arable margins. And then up here, up in Maidley, uh, we're working with Telford and Recon Council to um, uh, make a piece of amenity grassland more species rich. And just we want we know that if there are lots of people working across the bee lines um, from other organizations to landowners to gardeners and we would love people to add their projects to our map um, just so that we can see what people are doing on the on the bee lines and um, how the habitat connectivity is working so those dots are projects that are already been logged on there so um, if you're living on a bee line please don't so please do go and check if you are on our website um, buglife.org.uk um, and look for bee lines and you'll find the map and uh, please do add your project whether you've got um, a little wildflower area in your garden or you're planting nectar rich plants or maybe you're a landowner sowing arable rich margins but we want to hear about it whack it on there and what we're here to, today for is monitoring uh, we're promoting the pollinator monitoring scheme um, which is run by the center for ecology and hydrology with quite a few other partners but i won't run through all them now uh, i've put the link to the website here but we will send that to you after um, this webinar. Essentially, though, this is what we want people contributing to. We want to keep our uh, fingers on the pulse of what's happening to our pollinators. And this is just a really easy um, citizen science um, 
survey uh, that's set up to be quite simple um, that you can carry out. The hardest bit is identifying the different insects that land on your on your quadrat, essentially, and that's what Nigel's going to be teaching us. But to save me waffling on, we're just going to watch a quick video that runs through the methodology. So that was just a quick run through of the methodology. Um, if you do want to find out more, um, please do visit the website. We'll be sending a follow up email with these links in. Um, I won't go through it now because we want to hand over to Nigel. Um, but essentially, Nigel's part is is taking up the how you differentiate um, the the pollinator groups um, and and how you can um, split them up and, and gives you those uh, skills and the diagnostic features to know what you're looking at when it's sitting on a flower. Uh, just quickly, uh, we have lots of other events uh, coming up and we have a mailing list. If you want to be put on it, uh, please contact myself or Caitlin. Uh, there are our contact details there, but Caitlin will also be emailing everyone after the um, the webinar. And thank you very much. I will hand over. I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to Nigel. Um, Thanks, Kate. Right. And I will now share my screen. I hope. There we go. So hopefully everybody can see a picture of a fly on some ragwort. You Pretty just need to go full screen, Nigel. Yeah, and I'm then... going to do that now. Oh, yeah. great. OK. OK, so there we go. OK. Excellent. Right. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, some of you know, the, the bees, flies, and some of the other insects that you'll be trying to differentiate on um, on various plants. Uh, I'm just starting with this uh, slide here of um, a thing called the hornet uh, hoverfly, and it's actually one of the uh, biggest flies we get in this country. And coming into this time of year, through till about early September, you've uh, every chance of seeing some of these. What's interesting about these is um, they're quite good for sort of illustrating what's been happening to our uh, 
our, our insects over the last century with probably with, as a result of climate warming. Uh, in 1900, this fly was only really known occasionally from London, where you, it was much warmer and you had that urban heat island effect. And there were you know, just a few records most years. But as the century progressed, they started turning up uh, along the south coast of England. And then with more progression through the years, it started to sort of spread north through southern counties. And then in about between 1980 and 1990, it really started to move northwards and westwards across Britain. And certainly since the turn of uh, this century, since about 2000, it just has really taken off. And uh, it's probably, uh, it's almost certainly in, in response to climate change and particularly warming and perhaps uh, sort of drier years. And you can now see this fly. I first saw this in Shropshire in 2005, I think. So here we are now in 2021, six years later. And in Shrewsbury, where I live, you can guarantee seeing a good numbers of these uh, every year. Uh, and, you, uh, and it even sort of turns up, comes into the house at times. Uh, so it's a good one to know because you can impress your friends by not being scared of it because it's a big, intimidating insect, makes a loud buzzing noise, looks to the uninitiated like a hornet uh, and actually has an association with uh, wasps and things which I'll talk about later. Right, but zip on to the next slide. Uh, and sorry, and there's a picture, uh, a map there of its present um, distribution across Britain. So you can see it's well up into the sort of Yorkshire, Lancashire area. And there's even a record now confirmed from Glasgow. So it's probably within the next 10 to 20 years going to be throughout most of Britain. So uh, what you're being asked to look at for the, uh, the, 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 the fit count is bumblebees, honeybees, solitary bees, wasps, other flies, hopper flies and other flies as well as butterflies, beetles, small insects and other insects. I'm going to focus mainly today on the bees, uh, wasps and flies, because I think they're the ones that are probably differentiating those will probably give you the most trouble. I think most people will know whether I think there's something as a butterfly or moth or, an, or a different kind of insect. I've got one slide at the end with, a, with beetles on just to make sure everybody can recognise a beetle as opposed to these other insects. And then uh, the, the other things, small insects and other insects, we just have to work those out in the field because there just isn't enough time to cover them all in the time that we've got. So let's start with bees. Um, there are around 280 species in Britain. And uh, over the years, around 160 species have been found in Shropshire. And there are probably a few more to find. So we could be looking at 170, 180 species in Shropshire if we had more people looking for them and then actually being able to identify them. A lot of them are incredibly difficult to identify. You need dead specimens. You have to get them under the microscope, sometimes dissect out their, their genitalia and things like that. So uh, there's a good reason why you're not being asked to look at the various species of a lot of things, because it's quite difficult to do sometimes. So I'm going to start now with uh, looking at uh, a couple of insects that virtually everybody will be familiar with. Obviously, the first is the honeybee. We have one species of honeybee in, in Britain uh, and probably throughout Europe. And there are 24 species of bumblebee in the UK. I'll start with honeybees. Essentially, honeybees in this country are farmed insects. You know, they're kept in hives by beekeepers and they're pretty well looked after. So when we talk about sort of threats to bees, you can actually leave honeybees out of that. Although they are under pressure and there's all sorts of um, in diseases and other problems affecting them, they're, they're pretty well looked after. Uh, so they're not really under threat, they're just, you know, it's just getting harder to keep hives. So I regard those as farmed insects. You do get some wild nests. I see them in old woodlands with big old trees nesting in tree holes sometimes. I don't know how well those nests do, but there always seem to be a good few you know, flying in and out of them. Uh, with honeybees, the key difference in their life history between honeybees and all the other bees we get in this country is that the queens live several years. Everything else lives a year or less. Uh, so you effectively, because the adult uh, bees as well as the queens hibernate through the winter and they would normally feed on honey that they've made and stored in the hive, uh, they can you know they can be present at any time of year. You've probably all noticed honeybees particularly in re recent winters, 
uh, coming out and on things like Mahonia, you know, winter flowering shrubs and things, if there's a slightly warm day, you'll often see honeybees because they'll, they'll soon become active if there's a bit of sun on the hive. And the other difference between uh, honeybees and the other bees is that you'll get many thousands of honeybees in a colony, whereas bumblebees, you're looking at a few hundred at most in a nest and solitary bees in their uh, very different nests. Uh, there'll probably be 20 or 30 individuals and they'll, in the grub stage, which we'll look at later uh, at most. So bumblebees, I have actually put there that they're not domesticated, but of course I've forgotten, uh, I just thought of this before I <laughs> came into this, uh, that, uh, that there are sort of semi-domesticated uh, bumblebees. Uh, uh, they, they're basically a sort of strain of the buff-tailed bumblebee, which is probably one of our commonest bumblebees, which are um, actually, I think that most of them are bred uh, under special conditions in Holland and imported into this country and used in uh, mainly in um, tomato greenhouses. But the ones you'll be seeing will all will, will virtually all be wild native species. Um, now, comparing these to uh, honeybees, adults are the, the queen only lives about about a year uh, and individual workers in the nest and males probably just a few months each. Most uh, most of the rest of the time they're, they're either the queens will be hibernating over the winter and uh, there'll be no workers and no males. So they basically sort of hand the baton on, baton on the queens, hand the baton on to the next generation each spring when they wake up and uh, start creating nests. Uh, and they and they they either nest underground or thing thing or you know in, inside things like compost heaps and under sheds in people's gardens have probably noticed that. And then there are some that will use uh, many of them will use old mammal nests, mouse nests, and vole nests and things like that. And there are a few species that sort of make a nest which is above ground. Uh, they're remarkably difficult to find, and I think people probably find nests more often in their gardens than anywhere else. For instance, when they um, disturb. Uh, compost heaps. Uh, so just a quick run through a bumblebee life history. So in the spring, queens emerge from hibernation. And so that's normally in sort of March, April time. And they've uh, the first thing they need to do is to sort of regain some of the energy they've used up during the hibernation period. So they, you'll see them feeding on whatever flowers are around, particularly things like willow trees, which, which got a lot of early sort of nectar sources. So they'll be looking for nectar to drink and uh, basically restore their depleted energy resources. Then they'll start, the queen will start looking for potential nest sites. And usually by sort of mid-April through to early May, they will have established a nest somewhere. They'll lay the first few eggs on pollen that they have collected and made into little sort of receptacles of pollen. And then as soon as the first workers uh, are born, they soon take over from the queen and she just stays in the nest laying eggs uh, while the workers do the work going out, coming in, feeding the young and increasing the nest size. And uh, here's, a, here's a nest. This one here, I think, has probably been uncovered in a compost heap that's just been dug into and there's been a nest in the middle of it. So you don't normally see these unless you come across them like this or perhaps sometimes if you're walking in the countryside, you might come across one disturbed uh, or you're, where a badger is trying to dig it up and you often see this sort of scene there. So later in the year, when the colony sort of has grown to its sort of maximum size and it's getting on a bit. So really from almost sort of about now, mid July onwards um, through until uh, so it's about the, the end of August, what, what happens is that the nest starts to produce males. And when that happens, and also some new, new queens as well. And when that happens, the nest sort of start, you know, basically closes down. The workers stop working, and the and the males and new queens emerge. And you'll often see very sluggish-looking bees on flowers, particularly in August. They're not doing the classic thing that bumblebees do, which is just constantly moving from flower to flower, collecting pollen, supping nectar. They just wait around on the flowers, and they'll be the males. You can actually, with experience, tell that they're males because they have slightly longer antenna than the, the females, and some of them are quite differently coloured from the females. But the key thing is that they're much more sluggish because they're not collecting pollen or, or nectar. And then obviously uh, they mate, and once that's happened, 
the queen will uh, give itself a good feed, get you know, get its energy supplies and its sort of fat reserves built up as much as possible during August and early September. And you'll probably notice that pretty soon uh, after end of August, early September, the numbers of bumblebees have dropped right down and the queens, many and most of the queens by then will have hibernated and you won't see any more then until the spring. But interestingly, in recent years, again, almost certainly as a result of climate change and the you know, warming of uh, winters in Britain, uh, things, there's a couple of species, the tree bumblebee and uh, the bucktail bumblebee, which uh, started to be active over winter and you'll often see I say, so I won't say often, sometimes you'll see in urban areas, you know, in towns in Shropshire, uh, active worker bees in the winter. And, they've just, and those are nests which have just um, started up. The queen's probably come out of hibernation and started up very early in the middle of winter because uh, it's just been so warm. And I've seen that regularly over the last few years in my garden. So that's a change that's certainly happened in the last 10 to 15 years. OK, we better have a quick look at honeybees now. Um, I've just got some yellow arrows there. One of the key features for a, telling a honeybee apart from all the other hun you know, that's sort of 250 or so species of solitary bees uh, is the shape of the back leg. Um, and it's uh, it, the tibia there, it's ar arrowed with the top yellow arrow there. It's very sort of triangular and uh, wide. And then there's a very wide, what I call a tarsal segment uh, beneath it. Uh, now, the problem is that's often covered in pollen, so you can't actually make out the shape of that, uh, that, that back leg in either the solitary bees or the honeybee. But fortunately, there's a way of telling them apart. And we'll look at that uh, now. So, but first of all, just a quick intro to the solitary bees. Um, around about, well, I think there's more than 250 species in the UK, an awful lot of them look like this. Brown, black, with sort of tawny, um, orangey sort of coloured hairs on, on the bodies, uh, and they can be quite difficult to tell apart. And there's two, two main um, types of solitary bee. Uh, there's what I call the aerial nesting bee, the bees. These are ones that will nest above ground in holes in in timber, in cracks, in uh, in cliffs and things like that. Anywhere where there's a sort of crevice uh, in, in sunlit conditions. Um, some of them will even use, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll use things like a folded up newspaper. They'll use the sort of hollow where the fold is and uh, and nest in there. I've, see, I've seen photos of that sometimes, but mainly they'll be outside uh, using the sort of uh, holes in timber. And in nature, those holes would have been created by beetles that uh, li live as grubs in their larval stage in the timber, eating the timber. And when they come out, they leave these tunnels, which the bees are then able to use. And then there's the mining bees, which actually nest uh, underground and make that, you know, they actually, they, they actually dig out uh, nests. And quite amazingly, some of them will sort of go down probably up to a foot deep and they're only small insects. It's quite incredible what they're able to excavate. And for that reason, they often you often find them in uh, areas with you know, sandy soils or loose, friable soils. And there are just a few sort of more specialist ones that can cope with harder soils like clays. So quick run through uh, sort of model solitary bee life history. Uh, this is a general idea of how they work. There are uh, quite a few, quite a few of them are sort of slightly different um, versions of this, but uh, this sort of model is, is a good example. So in the spring or summer, particularly in the spring, you'll see the adult bees and that will be the females uh, and sometimes the males will emerge. They will mate uh, and then as soon as they're mated, the female starts to, uh, it's, she'll, she'll fuel up and then she'll start to construct a nest and then when she's made the first cell or two, she'll start to provision it with pollen, a mixture of pollen and nectar, which she then, uh, after she's done that, will lay an egg on, on a pollen ball inside a little, I've got a diagram of this coming up, inside a little um, a burrow underground. And then the larvae live in there, eat the, eat, eat the, um, the pollen ball, 
and they will overwinter either as a sort of semi-formed adult or as a pupa or sometimes even as a full as a full-blown adult and then <clears throat> and the reason for that is as soon as it warms up in the spring those spring emerging species are ready to go and um, you can get you can get some out as early as the sort of late late, late February locally now as soon as you get a warmish day in late February things like Clark's mining bee I'll just go back to that picture is the one on the right here uh, she, they, they will emerge as early as late February on warm days and they're a, spe they're a specialist on willow and they collect pollen off willow so you'll see them with this lovely golden yellow pollen on the legs which is the pollen off willow and that's why they're out early because that's you know, when willow flowers and uh, interestingly uh, quite a lot of the species the males will come out first and it'll be anything up to 10 to 2 weeks before the females start to emerge in numbers and the males will be seen sort of just searching constantly for females ready for when they emerge and I've got a video here of this thing called the vernal Caletes bee this is a species that uh, rather oddly spread uh, in the last 10 years has spread not north to south across the country it was a formerly very rare species in Britain, only found on the coast in North Wales and the Lancashire coast. And then just um, nobody knows why this has happened. Uh, it just suddenly started turning up inland at sand quarries, particularly and, and, and sandy places. And now uh, most sand quarries in Shropshire, you will find this bee. And there's a particular one near Shrewsbury where there's an absolutely immense colony of these bees. I'm just going to show you a, a video now. When the, when the video comes up, just watch the line between the sky and the ground underneath it, and you'll see what are basically part of a population of tens of thousands of males that have emerged in uh, March or early April this year, uh, and they're just quartering the ground in huge numbers, waiting for females to emerge. So there you are, lots of little black dots there flying around. That is the males. And, in this little quarry, sand quarry, it's only a small sand quarry, there were thousands, if not tens of thousands of those males. Now, what happens? Why are they doing that? Well, as soon as the female emerges, she's pounced on. And there's literally, you get these what they call mating balls. And there's so many males that are trying to mate with the female, but only one is successful. So eventually, when one manages to copulate with the female, the others will give up and they'll start looking for other females. And uh, rather humorously, sometimes when the when the successful male is finished mating with a female, uh, a lot of males will start trying to mate with him because he's carrying the sort of pheromone of the female on him. So they'll, they, they mistake him for a male. So you see these little clusters uh, rolling around on the ground and it's just a bunch of males who've been uh, fooled by the pheromone that's on them. Um, now, why does that happen? Well, the, the reason is that um, Mining bees and solitary bees, they don't lay many eggs. They're, it's a tough challenge. They've got to excavate in the ground. They've got to find pollen. They've got to make these pollen balls. They've got to um, lay the egg on there, then seal up the individual burrows and then seal up the actual entrance to the burrows. So they don't need to be wasting any time when they emerge in the spring looking for males and any kind of fancy courtship. So, in fact, although it all looks rather undignified, the way these males pounce on the, the females and mate with them, uh, in fact, a, you know, there's a clever plan behind it all. It's a, it's a result of evolution. It's, it basically helps these bees to be successful, even though they're, they're having to work hard to, to lay really very, very few eggs. You know, most insects, you'll be looking at uh, hundreds, if not thousands of eggs being laid by individuals. So that strategy for most insects a lot of insects is lay lots of eggs some of them will survive with bees it's lay a few but protect them really well which is why they have these sort of nests underground and in holes in wood which are sealed off so when you're out looking for uh, uh you know insects in the spring particularly you may you may well sort of just if you just look at any kind of bare earth or uh, areas of sparsely vegetated ground so this is a bit of a track on a common in Herefordshire uh, and in this bare ground here there were lots of these this is the ashy mining bee it's a black and white bee which uh, one of the first solitary bees people learn to recognize if they take an interest 
and there were probably uh, you know a good few dozen nests just in that stretch of bank there and here's one of the females just poking her head above ground as it warms up in the day sensing the temperature once it gets warm enough she'll be off uh, starting a day's work so there's a diagram of a fairly typical um, mining bees nest so what we have here this is the central entrance burrow there and then off it you've got these individual cells and at the bottom here you can see this is this is pollen that's been provisioned in that cell uh, an egg's been laid there's an egg on that side it's usually sort of attached above the pollen because the pollen will be quite damp and you don't you know the, the, the egg doesn't want to be attached to something damp and getting you know, in danger of um, get, getting a fungal infection once uh, the egg hatches the larva drops onto the pollen and starts eating it uh, and then eventually develops into a you know, full-grown larvae into a pupa and then eventually uh, the full grown the, the, the transforms into an adult uh, coming up to the next spring so basically these poor creatures basically spend most of the year sealed in a tomb for probably nine to ten months nearer ten months of the year and the adult stage is really a relatively short-lived stage um, you can see that a lot of the uh, burrow is sort of sealed with lots of soil which is basically pulled back down in, into the burrow it's the stuff that's been excavated out pulled back in and all of these cells will be sealed off and also the top of the burrow at the entrance will have quite a deep section of uh, soil compact you know soil and loose sand compacted into it and sealed off so it's a very secure environment but there are all sorts of things obviously that have evolved alongside the bees that find their way in unfortunately i haven't got time to talk about those today so I'm going to look at aerial nesters now. Now, this is one of our smallest bees. And if you look at this, the, the photo of this bee here, you will see this orange here. This is a bunch of orange hairs underneath the abdomen and all the aerial nesters, they have, they carry their pollen underneath the abdomen on this pollen scoper. Whereas the, uh, the mining bees that we looked at will carry it uh, on the back of the thorax here and on the hind leg and a pollen scope which is made of long hairs on the hind leg so i've just got a little video to show you here of this bee so this is the companiola uh, scissor bee i think it's called uh, it's called Kelostoma companionarum now bear in mind those holes there are about two to two and a half millimeters across this is an incredibly small little bee and i think what she's doing there is she's just sizing up this hole and preparing it. Uh, I think she decided to use this for a nest and she's just sort of preparing it, getting anything out of it and getting rid of it. Just switch that back, uh, go to the next slide. And you can actually identify this bee in the garden. You know, I, I have these in the garden. You come across these little holes. By the way, they shove these teeny little bits of grit into this mud that they've collected. And there's some there. Uh, you see that and you probably almost certainly got um, that little bee, Kelostoma companionarum, or the um, Campanula scissor bee. It's a specialist that collects uh, pal pollen from Campanula. Uh, some of you may well have come across this, leaf cutter bees. You may even have seen them um, carrying rolled up sections of leaf, which they cut out of, a, out of leaves. Uh, so you sometimes see this in your garden. And they actually construct these um, sort of capsules, basically, out of sections of leaf. And they cut different shapes of uh, section for the sides of the um, capsule and for the ends of the capsule. So there's pollen inside that, your pollen ball, and the eggs laid in there. And the same process as goes on with the mining bees. It takes place within there, but it's just above ground in a hole that's been lined with... Um, with, with leaf sections, quite remarkable that these bees can sort of do all of this. And, uh, it's, 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 it's almost unbelievable, really. But I've seen it, so it does happen. Uh, and then some. There are some other species. They're all aerial nesters with their. Oh, let's just go back to it, see if we can see. Just point out there. Look, there's that pollen scoper. If you can see my cursor on the underside of the abdomen. That's where. So she's busy provisioning the nest at the. Sorry, building the nest at the moment. So she's not carrying pollen. So you can see the scoper. Once she starts collecting uh, pollen, when you'll see these things on flowers, that pollen scoper 
uh, will be covered in yellow pollen normally and you won't be able to see the hairs will just be a massive yellow there so here are some um, nest entrances of a few other of the aerial nesting bees um, this one is actually made of leaves but these are chewed up into a leaf mastic and that's a little uh, one of the little mason bees so although it belongs to the mason bee genus osmia uh, it actually doesn't use mud uh, uh, like the other mason bees do it uses this leaf mastic and here's the classic red mason bee on the right uh, the mud seal so they collect mud and seal their nests um, and they make they build their individual cells with mud so you can you can see the evidence of those by finding that and uh, just a little video to show you uh, so in the image here this is a female red mason bee and uh, you can probably make out she's collected a ball of damp wet soil there and she'll take that back and she'll use that for building and sealing her nest and I came across one, uh, a quarry basically or a mine made by hundreds of these bees in North Shropshire a few years ago and I managed to get a little bit of video which I'll show you now uh, so as you're watching this there's a this bee here is scraping up soil there's one that's just come out this literally inside a mine this was quite a large hollow and lots of bees were coming in there eventually one of these will come it come out fly off and it's carrying its mud back to the nest and there were probably hundreds of bees on that site it was on a section of riverbank under shady trees which meant that it was quite moist so i expect these bees were coming from a long distance around and all collecting their mud from that site so another remarkable sort of thing really about uh, you know, about these bees is the way that, you know, they, you know, they, they can construct nests and find the right sort of consistency soil to seal nests with and build them. Quite amazing. So back to our honeybee. Just to remind you, look at the shape of that tibia and that tarsal segment there, very broad, very triangular but sometimes they cut, well, most of the time they're covered in pollen. But if you see that, you know you've got, you know you've got a, a honeybee. But most of the time when you see them on flowers, obviously they're on the flowers because they're collecting pollen and uh, collecting nectar. And then most of the bees will actually use a combination of uh, sort of saliva from their mouth and pollen collected, um, which they sort of wet down to keep it onto, on their legs quite well. And that's why they're sort of not only collecting nectar to fuel up, but also uh, to, you know, so they've got plenty of, um, they can produce plenty of, I'll call it saliva, it's not really saliva, but you know, it's something they can produce from the mouth. And the honeybees particularly, and the bumblebees, actually really dampen the pollen that they collect on their bodies and they scrape it off onto the back legs. And can you, you can probably see here, it's a very compact, shiny tablet and that, uh, look for that on the honeybee and a little video to show you so you can have a little practice in a minute. And just have a look at how that compares with a typical mining bee that's, that, that really looks quite messy by comparison. The honeybees often look quite neat. There's just a little bit of pollen scattered around on the body, but most of it's collected in this neat little tablet there. Uh, whilst these are, you know, have just got this powdery sort of um, texture to them so that's probably the easiest way to tell a honeybee from all the very similar looking mining bees the other way is that most of the mining bees are much smaller or quite a bit smaller than honeybees so that's a help but there are some mining bees that are getting on for honeybee sized so you do need to just be sure you've got a, a, a mining you know a solitary bee rather than a honeybee uh, it doesn't take long with practice. You won't have to look too hard. You'll just be able to look at a honeybee and a mining bee. You think, oh, that's a honeybee because they just they've got a different look about them altogether. They got to some. Uh, I always think that I don't know what it is, but the heads just look totally different. And if you look at enough, you'll soon because you see you'll see lots of honeybees. You'll soon get a tally something's not a honeybee because it'll look a bit dip, a bit different. But if you're in doubt, just check the way the pollen's arranged. So. I'm going to start with this is a little it's quite a small bee I get in the garden it's called Davis's Kalitis bee uh, it likes it's uh, it, 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 uh, this genus Kalitis they all seem to be associated with uh, flowers in the daisy family so they're fairly catholic in their choice of daisies they don't go on other, sort of, uh, other flowers but they'll use any kind of daisy so this is a North American uh, 
member of the daisy family that's in my garden they'll use that happily they don't just need native species they're very happy to use anything like that so i'm going to play you a video now i just want you to look when uh, at the look at the pollen spread out over the body because uh, this is what it'll be like in the field you'll be having to sort of think mm, is that a honeybee also it's got stripes on its abdomen you can see that so that helps you I have to warn you that in life you don't get this good of you because it's a lot smaller than that in life so we're cheating a bit here but hopefully you can see that even though it's moving around you can tell that that pollen um, is in that sort of powdery form now here's a honeybee let's just look at this and just so see how clean she is and then I'll just stop this video when she turns around and we get a view of that tablet of pollen so you can probably see there there's the tablet of pollen and if I click it on and she moves around a bit, you should still be able to see that quite clearly. So there you are. That's my recommended way to tell a honeybee from all the similar looking uh, solitary bees. It's that arrangement of pollen on the leg. And obviously some of the solitary bees are aerial nesters, so they'll have the pollen underneath the abdomen. So they look really quite different. So you shouldn't mistake those. But you may need to look a bit harder to separate the mining bees from honeybees. I'm just going to mention these because they don't collect pollen, but they do. They, and these are all cuckoos on the various species of bee that I've been talking about. So uh, this is a cuckoo bumblebee. And they generally are all fairly specific to one or two species of host and uh, they cheat. They worked out somewhere along the evolutionary line that uh, you don't need to spend all that effort building a nest uh, and collecting pollen and all that business. You can just hang around, find the nest uh, of, a, of a suitable host species. And whilst the host is away collecting pollen, you can nip in there, lay your egg on the hosts. Um, pollen store and your egg hatches first kills and eats or uh, kills and or eats the, uh, the the egg or the young larvae of the host bee and then has a free feast and the host bee very obligingly actually seals your bee in and makes it all safe and secure so um good strategy for those and there's a nice variety of those uh, you don't need to worry about being able to identify those because if you see them on flowers they all count they're all they'll be visiting the flowers to um to collect nectar and in doing that they will be passing across the flowers and inadvertently sort of collecting pollen on their bodies and brushing uh, pollen off onto the stamens and anthers of, uh, of 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 other flowers and thereby pollinating them right that's bees quick run through bees. Uh, here's a rather intimidating figure. Uh, and this is why we're not we're not asking you to identify flies to species. There are over 7,000 species in the UK. So plainly a massive challenge. And even for me, my main interest in life is flies. And I only probably look at a couple of thousand of species because most of them are so small and uh, difficult to do that you've really got to specialise in them. But you'll be so you're basically be calling these little things here. They're very teeny. You'll just call them other small insects. And then these others here are going to be classified as either other flies or hoverflies. Now on here, there's only one hoverfly and it's that one. Now I'm going to do a run through now of various types of hoverflies there are. And then we'll have a quick look at how will you know it's not a hoverfly or if it is a hoverfly? you are being asked to try and differentiate between um, hoverflies and other flies. So first of all, I've just got this shot here. This actually, this is, this is a hogweed flower. Uh, 10 years ago, no more than that, this was a typical site. Uh, you come across these plates of hogweed flowers and angelica and other umbellifers, and they would be alive with hoverflies and quite often other flies, particularly in woodlands. Now, sadly, the last five, six, seven years, this has become an increasingly rare site and I hardly ever see it now. So we really want you not to get you know, defeatist about this. If you are finding very few, uh, particularly flies, it doesn't seem to have affected bee numbers so much. If you're finding very few, we need to know you're finding very few. You know, these figures are going to be very important. 
uh, either for sort of hopefully detecting a resurgence of numbers in later years or hopefully not uh, a continuing declining numbers. Uh, typically now when I go out I will see plates of hogweed like this with maybe one, two other flies on and maybe a, another couple of other flies. Uh, sometimes none at all. It, it's uh, quite depressing for somebody who's been looking at them for decades. So there is a bit of a crisis going on, I'm convinced. Um, and doing this fit count is really a brilliant way that you'll be able to help get figures together to demonstrate what's happening to our fauna in Britain and try and sort of convince the, uh, the movers and shakers in politics that you know we really are up against a problem here and we need to do something about it. OK, so, well, not only have you got to learn how to tell flies, hoverflies from other flies, um, it's also quite a challenge in that you've got to tell a particular type of hoverfly, known as a drone fly, from honeybees. And as you can see here, these are two journals of uh, beekeepers associations, and they've got pictures of hoverflies on the front because these are such good mimics that they've been fooled and it's made it onto the cover of their journals. Uh, I can't believe that, you know, they, that this wouldn't have been spotted, but this is not uncommon. So here's your first challenge. How are you going to tell a drone fly, so this is a type of hoverfly from a honeybee? It's actually not that difficult. So you'll be able to show up beekeepers who can't do this uh, and impress them with your knowledge. One of the first things to look at is, when you see them, is the size of the eyes uh, on on hoverflies, especially the males, the, the, hover, the, the eyes are so big they actually meet on top of their head. And even in the females, there's only a small gap. So uh, with honeybees, you'll see a big gap across the top of the head and the eyes just look a lot smaller. And then another very helpful feature is if you can't see this long, thin, thread-like antenna, which is typical of bees and many other insects, then you've probably got a hoverfly rather than you rather than a bee. And the hoverflies, most of them, the antenna is just three segments, and it's usually this little small, almost circular shape. So it's very different. Not always easy to see that little antenna on a moving fly, but it is always possible to see without too much effort the long antenna. So if you can't see the antenna, it's probably going to be a fly. Count it as a fly. If you can, then it's a bee. So then you've just got the task of is it a honeybee or a solitary bee. And I'm going to assume that most people won't have much trouble telling um, a bumblebee from all the other bees because they're big, fluffy, rotund looking things. Um, most people are familiar with them. But if anybody isn't, um, there, I, there's some resources I'll point you at at the end of this talk. So you can go and have a look at those and have a sort of practice uh, in gardens and things. And you'll soon get to grips with that. But let's get back to telling uh, drone flies apart from honeybees. This is a key thing you'll need to do because both of these insects are amongst the commonest you'll see on flowers. So do practice that. They, all, they also, the flies will have a broad waist, whereas uh, all wasps and bees have a narrow waist. And I've got some slide, another slide later on showing that for wasps and the same will apply for bees. Not always that easy to spot. So I recommend the um, look at the eyes and the um, the, 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 the shape of the antenna is the best way of being sure. So just a quick look at drone flies. Uh, these actually live in a sort of sludge around the edge of ponds. They basically uh, live on decomposing uh, wet, fairly dense sludgy material, organic materials basically that are rotting. Uh, around ponds and even sort of around the edges of silage pits and things like that. They can tolerate fairly um, you know, toxic situations, which is probably why they're so common. And there is one species, uh, the one on the, the right here, which you can actually tell uh, what species it is by its behaviour. Um, I'll just go on to the next slide. So at the bottom here, this is a female. So this is Aristalis nemorum. Uh, I don't know, I don't think it's got an English name, but it's a, it's smaller, just go back to this. It is, it's about no more than two thirds the size of the bigger hover, the bigger drone flies that you'll see most of. Uh, so that gives you, a, gives you an idea of what it is. But if you actually see some of these smaller looking or any, any sort of drone fly looking uh, flies 
hovering over another one that sat on a flower. What you've got is, is this the female at the bottom sat on the flower and these are two males. And I, I took this picture some years ago, but actually what you can't see is there's a third male off, you know, off, off the photo there, which was hovering above these. And the males do this lovely little courtship thing where they fly up and down above the female and they'll follow her around from flower to flower until until she's impressed enough by uh, by all this sort of courtship and will mate with the, with the male and i've actually seen up to four males trailing around in a little train behind the female every time she lands on a plant they're all hovering above her. it's a fantastic thing to see and you if you're looking enough at uh, plants you may well you know it's not unusual to see that so you may well see that so look out for that and if you see it, you'll know that's that that species, but you don't need to worry about actually naming the species. It's, that's just out of interest for you. You just need to put that down as a hoverfly. So here are the typical hoverflies, that, uh, apart from those drone flies that many people may have heard of or be, be familiar with. Yellow and black things, they're sort of wasp mimics. I'm sorry, I haven't spoken about that. I'll just go back. Um, so these uh, these are I forgot to mention that these are brilliant mimics the uh, drone flies not only do they look quite like uh, bees so that you know enough to fool beekeepers and the editors of beekeeping journals but they actually uh, behave somewhat like honeybees as well when you see them coming into land on a flower they have tend to have their legs dangling down beneath them much like a honeybee does. Apparently, they, when they move from flower to flower, they often move the same sort of distance that a honeybee will, and they will often spend the same sorts of uh, the same lengths of time on individual flowers as a honeybee will. So they actually not only look like honeybees, they've evolved so they actually behave quite similarly to honeybees. And obviously, what they get from that is, is a level of protection from potential predators. Who, if the, you know, if, if a predator is previously had a stab at a honeybee and got a sting, it's pretty soon going to learn to leave alone anything that looks and acts like a honeybee. So these are master imitators. And other good imitators are some of the yellow, and there's a, there's a whole range of yellow and black hoverflies, lots of different species. Uh, I don't know if I've forgot, forgotten what I've mentioned now, but there are around about 280 pushing on for, probably getting on for 290 species of hoverflies in Britain. Many of them are yellow and black like this. Uh, you're just being asked to say whether it's a hoverfly in your camp, so you don't have to worry about the, the, the different species. You can see there's some lovely looking things. Uh, and what I want you to note with these, just look at the join between the abdomen and the thorax. It's wide. So there's no sort of constriction of the thorax as it joins, even in this narrow thing, as it joins, as it's constriction rather of the abdomen, sorry as it joins the thorax. So this is a thorax, that's the abdomen, thorax, abdomen, thorax, abdomen. And it's sort of more or less, you know, it's not much narrower than the thorax where the abdomen joins. So looking at wasps, and this is the same for bees versus drone flies. Um, but wasps in particular, because they're not particularly hairy, you can see this constriction really well. Can you see there? And here it's even it's really in some senses it's really exaggerated. You cannot mistake that as a as a as a fly. Uh, there are a few flies that imitate these narrow waisted wasps, which is a bit of an, a, a bit annoying. But you won't see you you won't see many of those at all. So they're not going to affect your overall fit camp figures. And here's a typical um, typical social wasp. These are the things that we're all used to sort of buzzing us when having a picnic in sort of September time when the uh, nests are finished and the workers are out with nothing to do, so they just come and look for jam at picnics, etc. And can you see there that the join is very constricted between the abdomen and the thorax? So um, looking at the lifestyles of hoverflies, um, uh, most of those yellow and black species, uh, the vast majority are aphid predators, so they potentially you know useful for um, agriculture there's a lot of there's quite a bit of work going on researching how effective these might be as biocontrol for aphids uh, interestingly what the this is the larvae here when they grab an aphid they lift it up in the air and suck suck, suck the in, inside out of it and then put it down before they move on to the next one and they can get through uh, 
they can probably get through uh, you know, a few hundred, each individual larvae will get through a few hundred aphids in its, li in its lifetime. And each fly is laying, uh, I think I read somewhere that some of them lay thousands of eggs, but certainly hundreds. So you can imagine one female can be responsible for a lot of offspring. And the reason they lift up the aphid like that, if we think, is that uh, it means that the legs of the aphid aren't in contact with the surface, so they can't sort of struggle and push their way away from the larvae. The larvae sort of pierces the aphid, lifts it into the air, and it's helpless. It can't get away. Uh, so here are some hoverflies that look like bumblebees. So we've had hoverflies that look like wasps, hoverflies that look like honeybees, and now we have hoverflies that look like bumblebees. And just look at how similar those two are. How are you going to tell those apart? Well, again, I mean, so this is the bumblebee here, and here's the fly. Now, rather inconveniently, this particular genus, Volucella, they're all bumblebee or bee mimics, and they're quite large. They have a thing called, uh, uh, well, all flies have a thing called an arista, and it's this long, thin thing here off the um, antenna. But it's usually quite sort of fluffy looking, and it doesn't stand out very well. So you can still usually rely on looking for this antenna here, the long thread-like antenna. This still doesn't really look long and thread-like, but if you're in doubt, just check the eyes, much bigger eyes than on a bee. Uh, and, you'll, and you'll find that uh, bees are much more active on flowers than these hoverflies. So that's another thing to look at. How much is it moving around? If it's moving around a lot, check for the th thread-like antenna and you'll know you've got a bumblebee. If it's a bit if it's a bit more stable on a flower feeding from it and it's got a sort of long proboscis coming out into a flower from its mouth um, that will indicate quite strongly that you've got a hoverfly uh, again once you've seen a few of these you'll pretty soon be able to just tell by looking at them you'll get used to the way they look differently interestingly th this species actually mimics uh, both red-tailed bumblebees and white-tailed bumblebees that's the same species of hoverfly actually mimicking two sorts of bumblebee. And then there's another large one. I just throw this one in really for the uh, any any anybody from the farming community amongst us because it reminds me of um, this, the belted Galloway. So although it's known as the pied hoverfly, or its scientific name, Volucella pelicans, uh, I nicknamed it the belted Galloway fly. And you can see it's got the same pattern, black, white, black. So just a bit of fun there. And in the, in the same genus is this fly I talked about at the beginning of the uh, talk here, and that's the hornet hoverflies. We have two in this country, two species of hornet hoverfly in, in this country. And uh, all of these volucella hoverflies, the big things that look like wasps, so that look like bee, uh, bumblebees and hornets in this case, uh, share a similar lifestyle. Before we look at that, I'll just point out that if anybody focuses on ivy as a target plant, and I'd recommend that for anybody sort of early September onwards. Uh, if it's a hot summer, you'll s often get ivy in flower in August, but certainly into September when other flower resources are drying up, ivy comes into its own and that's the best place to see these hornet hoverflies and quite a lot of other um, other pollinators as the season draws to an end. It's a great resource for helping them to fuel up and get through the winter. And you can just get an idea of the size of these uh, hornet hoverflies. That's a typical drone fly there, which is which is one of our larger flies, and this thing's absolutely massive. So you'll often hear these before you see them. They get a really loud hum as they come into land. And uh, all of those will look volucella hoverfly, uh, sorry, bumblebee and Hornet mimickers that are actually associated with wasp and possibly also bumblebee nests, but certainly with wasp nests. The females somehow, presumably because they have some kind of pheromone masking, are able to enter wasp nests, lay eggs in there, and usually then they die in the nest once they've got in there. They might get stung eventually by a wasp that figures out this is an intruder, shouldn't be here. But uh, the, the, the eggs hatch and the larvae live in the nests and mostly they probably just live on detritus and uh, it's dropped 
because these wasps are bringing in insects that they've collected um, to feed to their own grubs and lots of sort of poo from the larvae of the wasps drops down to the bottom bits of dead body of insects and I think probably all, uh, also it has been found when this has been studied more closely that the hoverfly larvae can also predate on the uh, the larvae of the wasp they'll actually sometimes when they're quite young the larvae of the fly will squeeze its way down into the cell that the wasp larvae is in and actually start to feed uh, either on the poo that the wasp larvae um, exudes or even I think they've been found actually eating the wasp larvae. So yeah fascinating. Uh, the other thing that happens with the hoverflies and why they're remarkable is that they can actually um, migrate vast distances. It's been found that they can probably in individual uh, insects, and they're only you know really quite small little insects. These can probably migrate uh, from sort of you know the Iberian Peninsula and eventually reach Britain. And in, every now and then, and the last time this happened was about ten years ago. You get these absolutely massive migration events, and uh, the country will be full. Of little yellow and black hoverflies, many of which will be this species known as the marmalade hoverfly, Epicircus boldiatus. I'm just going to show you with this video, which was taken 10 years ago in my garden. And if you just watch it carefully, hopefully you'll see lots and lots of flies. Just gives you an idea of the vast numbers that arrived in this migration event. There must, there were estimates that there were billions in the country, and it, well, that was probably not wrong, because these are there just hundreds and hundreds on a bit of white briony I allowed to grow over a trellis in my garden. It was quite staggering to see. And uh, so this hasn't happened for about 10 years. You, every year there are migration events, but not normally on that scale. But it's particularly if you live on the coast, people often note there's suddenly a surge of numbers of these little hoverflies, uh, and it's usually stuff coming in, um, and they'll slowly move their way across the country. So you can imagine the uh, the sort of eco services from these in a mass migration event like that, they would eat an awful lot of aphids. Pity it doesn't happen, happen every year because they would uh, cleanse crops of aphids in no time. That happened all the time. So, just looking at other flies and pollination services, <clears throat> I did a survey a few years ago on some dunes in the north mid Wales, and we put some what we call pan traps out, which just yeah, they their bowls with water in and flies land in it and drown and we can find out what species are there and we can't we, we found loads of these this is a very common little thing it's a woodlouse parasite it's a parasite of woodlice and we found that they were carrying the pollinia of marsh hellebrines and there were lots of marsh hellebrines on this site and every one that had landed in a pan trap so there were dozens of these had this what's called a pollinia which is attached to the fly when it goes to suck nectar from the uh, from the flower, and then when it goes to the next flower, obviously there's a great wadge of pollen stuck to it, and it's almost certain to um, pollinate the next flower that it goes to. And there's quite a lot of um, curious and amazing little you know, associations like that with many insects, and that's the first time I'd actually witnessed this with uh, with with flies. Just thinking of the difference between hoverflies and other flies, so basically the 280 or so hoverflies and the thousands of other flies. Um, mostly hoverflies are glossy, quite colourful, or if they're not glossy, they're very sort of furry and bumblebee-like. Whereas other flies are much usually much more dowdy, and often they've got quite a lot of, sort of bris spiky bristles and things. So just look out for that. And here's a typical spiky non-hoverfly. So that one, this is a thing called a Tachina ferra. It's a parasitoid of in, in the larval stage. It's a parasitoid of various moth larvae. And although it's quite sort of orange and colourful, it's not a hoverfly. And the best way to sort of determine this not is to just look out for this sort of general spikiness of bristles and the lack of so, so you never get that spike you never get those spiky bristles on hoverflies and generally it just doesn't look smart and shiny like a shiny new car almost as many hoverflies do so and there are more resources to help you sort of practice telling flies apart but that's one of the easiest ways so quick um 
look at Beatles, I literally just got this one slide because I'm assuming most people won't struggle. But the key difference between beetles and all other insects is that they, uh, sorry, most other insects, uh, some of the plant bugs uh, also feature this, but they have, a, they, have, they have a wing case over the wings. So it's uh, hardened the leecher. So, it, so, so they don't, you know, you can't actually, on most species, you can't see the wings when they're crawling around on flowers because they've got these wing, these hard wing cases uh, shut over the wings. So they look very different looking insects. And even in this species here, which you'll see lots of, even though you can see a bit of the wing, it's quite obviously a wing case over it, although part of the wing is exposed. And again, obviously note the thread like antennae. And this is a species you'll see a lot of. It's got these great bulbous hind legs and it's a thing called Oedemera nobilis. So if you see that, you can actually name the species of that lovely metallic green little beetle with great thick thighs. I think it's called the thick thighed something or other. Yeah, I, I don't know the English names for a lot of these things. Apologies for that. Now, a final warning. You um, Fortunately, now, as we're moving through the summer, the sawflies, which are actually a kind of wasp, a primitive kind of wasp that don't have a constricted waist. But you still will see these around and often on flowers. Unfortunately, they look rather fly like. So you just depending with these on looking at the antenna. Uh, and if they're long and thread like you see that it's a wasp, you can put that down as a wasp because it is actually a type of wasp. But they're basically vegetarian wasps. <clears throat> Most of the other wasp species are either parasitic on other insects or they're predatory and uh, kill and take uh, <coughs> other in they kill and collect other insects and take them back to the nest to feed to the larvae. Whereas these are vegeta they're vegetarians of the wasp world. So just be aware of those. They're rather hoverfly like sometimes to the unpracticed eye. But again, if you check for the thread like antenna you'll know it's not a fly and eventually after you've seen maybe a dozen or so you're not even that you'll soon to sort of get your eye and they just look different okay um what about id help well the ceh center for environment and hydrology that run the uh, fit pollinator has the fit counts and are administering it all and taking all your uh, your data in when you send it into them. It produce some really useful pages uh, which run through all the stuff I've told you and more information besides. The easiest way is uh, I, I looked at the web address and it was a great long stream. So the easiest thing is if you're using Google as a search engine or pro, pro, you know, and you, probably other search engines like DuckDuckGo, if you just type in fit count ID, you'll see a PDF file. It's usually near the top of the search results list. Just click on that and you'll get these are individual pages on on that web page and uh, I'd recommend starting there if you're unsure about things and finally if you want to know more if you really want to get into uh, these things you don't need to do this for the fit count but uh, you know, if you start looking at these you will almost inevitably get interested and want to know more there's a wonderful book called Britain's Hoverflies by Stuart Ball and Roger Morris I'd recommend that Unfortunately, not cheap. I think it's about £25. It's a fantastic field guide to all the bees of Great Britain and Ireland. That's about £30. So, you know, don't get it unless you really want to know, uh, uh, you know what, what species you're looking at. And then finally, a bit of a sh uh, shameless plug here. I think you can still get this. Um, in 2014, I and a friend of mine produced an atlas of the bees, wasp and ants of Shropshire, and that will give you a fairly up to date idea of the species we've got in Shropshire it's got it's got um, it's got maps for each species in Shropshire and notes about where you find them and uh, whether it's common or not so that's just for anybody who wants to get to grips with more with our local fauna and that's uh, called a provisional atlas of the bees wasps and ants of Shropshire the reason we called it a provisional atlas is there were really very few of us trying to make these records so it's a sort of best we could do job of an assessment of what we'd got in Shropshire. So I, earlier on I said there's around about 160 species of bee in Shropshire, but they're almost certainly going to be more than that. And they're just, we just haven't managed to detect them, particularly where some of you will be uh, doing these counts. In, um, in South Shropshire around Bridge North, there's more chance of more species down there. 
actually, but it's slightly warmer than where we're, we're based in uh, Shrewsbury. And we've done a lot of our records, I mean, from around this area. <clears throat> Whenever we got into areas around Bridge North, there was always a really good variety of bees. And I think that, yeah, that brings me to the end of that. So I will now stop sharing and hand back to Kate and Caitlin. Fantastic. Fantastic. Hope uh, it wasn't uh, too uh, fast. Oh, no, <laughs> well, I don't want to Got there right, with right. minutes to spare, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't think we just have any last minute questions. Um, um, please feel free to go through to just put them in the chat now. Chat now. Um, um, but otherwise, um, um, I'm sending you uh, kind of a, a final, final email from us, uh, kind of just with a little bit of a feedback form. So that'd be great if you could. Uh, or could spare the time to fill that out obviously it provides us with some really valuable feedback and information um about the events and about um i guess just what you've you've all learned this evening which is fantastic um so let me just 